Joe Dancy with the SMU McGuire Energy Institute. I'm Associate Director. Thank you for joining the program. A couple of reasons we're going to have you on today, but I'd like to start off with an update from the Interstate Oil and Gas Commerce. Now, I, there's I-O-G-C-C, so there's an extra C I missed in there. Help me out. Interstate Oil and Gas Compact Commission. And That's it's been it. around since the 30s, is what uh, in Governor Marlin and the Texas governor in Arkansas and, and New Mexico, back in the 30s, we had a big problem. We had the Oklahoma City field came in, barn burner. We had the East Texas oil field came in, barn burner. We had the Seminole oil field came in, barn burner. <laughs> so the price of oil you know, went through the floor, and uh, the governors figured they better get together and figure out what to do, and they put this organization together, and now I think they have 37 or 38 states, and the governors are all um, the appointed uh, point person, and they appoint representatives to the uh, to the uh, commission, and we meet twice a year, and, and quite frankly, we meet and we deal with it's regulators, it's executives, and they got a few academics like myself. And so, uh, anyway, the uh, it works really well. We talk about regulatory issues, and uh, we just met in Oklahoma City uh, last week, and we had all the parties were here. And one of the big issues that came up was uh, really a number of issues from North Dakota. Now, North Dakota it sort of takes the lead on some of this stuff because number one, you got some really good regulators up there and number two the oil is such a big part of the state they understand how important it is but what your governor did um you've had some pipeline leaks up there i mean oil pipelines and i mean this is last five or six or seven years where jason oil you know has leaked for you know months before they found the problem and uh, the governor they did a big study and found out the north dakota industrial commission figured out that uh doing the statistics it's more likely that you or I walking down the street or plowing our field or driving down the county road would find an oil leak than the than the uh, alarm monitors. <laughs> and so the governor of North Dakota, and I can't remember exactly what his name is, but Doug Burgum. He, yeah, yeah, and he, he essentially jumped in and said, "Look, you know, this is not working out. We need, you know, we need something." that's going to find these leaks much faster. We can't have situations where something leaks for two or three weeks before we find it. Um, And so what they've done is they've got an association of uh, industry type folks, including I think Boeing is involved, which is a big player. Of course, North Dakota is involved, which is a big producing state. And what they're doing is on a year by year basis, they're looking at cutting edge technologies that, uh, can be used to maybe identify oil leaks um, before they become an environmental or safety disaster. And, of course, North Dakota, and we've had this problem in Texas, too, and Louisiana, and actually Alabama and parts, uh, you get out in the rural areas, and, you know, if you have a 40- or 50-year-old pipeline, Jason, and it starts to leak, you know, if it's, if it's in the rural areas, it can leak for quite some time before they especially if it's a small leak and some of the stuff that's happened in North Dakota, they tell me, you know, this one that leaked for a month, it was a quarter size, is a quarter size um, gap. And it, they think it got, the pipe got hit by lightning. It didn't catch fire, but it you know, blew out a quarter size piece of uh, pipe and it leaked. And, and literally it, it's cost them, I mean, $20 million to remediate it somewhere up in the, up in North Dakota, but but what they've done, the regulators um, on this, they call the project is called I Pipe. I don't know why it's I Pipe, but it's you know it stands for something. And Intelligent so, Pipeline Integrity Program. Oh, okay, that, that's that's exactly it. God, you got you got a great memory. I, I forgot. It's it's my home state, so I'm pretty familiar with the. Uh, with the program that you're talking about, we've had uh, some experts on the program here to talk about it. In fact, I'm supposed to be heading up to the Energy Environmental Resource Center this week for a VIP private showing of this particular program, as well as some other ones that, you know, only a handful of invitation type things have been handed out. But it, uh, I'm glad to I imagine it was Jay uh, Elmley down there who was speaking on this. Uh, here's a number of different speakers, and I can't remember. I mean, North Dakota had 
I always bring three or four people, and one is always Lim Helms. Which oh, is, yeah. I know him because he's a regulator. And I did, was, did he start he off his presentation with a joke? Yeah, he, he starts <laughs> off with the only joke, and it's, uh, <laughs> and it's, uh, it's always stupid, but it's always funny. <laughs> Uh, I, I really enjoy uh, interviewing uh, Lynn Helms. Really enjoyed it. I've, in fact, I, I can't think of a bad interview I've ever had with him over the years. He's been very accessible. Um, doesn't I like it because he doesn't get into the political bombastic language. He stays pretty cut and dry, but at the same time, he does have a sense of humor. Yeah, he does, and he and he's very practical. And I can tell you. You know, from a third party, from an academic standpoint, he he takes a very good regulatory stance where he, you know, he takes a reasonable position that's not outrageous and it's not, you know, totally, um, you know, shut everything in and wait 10 years before you figure it out either. He's 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 reasonable and, and that's the position. Of course, you know, he's sometimes he's not the boss, but that's, you know, his general recommendation. So it's always. Interesting, but I tell you that the technology they have, there's three technologies they're, they're talking about, one of which uses um, satellite data, and then what they're using is um, machine learning, which is artificial intelligence, uh, to actually see if they can find pipeline leaks. So what they do, apparently the satellite data, and you, you might be more up on this than I am, but apparently the satellite data, they can almost get it in real time. And so when you take a satellite shot today and then you take another one tomorrow and you run it through this machine learning database and program, if there's problems, they can actually find, they can actually find leaks. And actually, they tested out the, the software. They actually had a, a, they actually made a, a artificial leak to see if the satellite and the, and the uh, software would find it. And it did. I mean, one of the problems, though, that they have with the satellites is um, in North Dakota, if you have like, you know, two weeks worth of cloudy weather and snow, um, you can't shoot through, you can't shoot through the clouds. So the the second part of the program is they're going to use drones and drones that are out of line of sight, which is really cutting edge. The, The regulations now say you have to keep your drone within line of sight, which Boy, I tell you what, if you've ever flown a drone, if you can see a drone a half mile away, your your eyes are better than mine. It's <laughs> it's difficult, but they're going to be able to put a drone and they're going to run it down the pipeline and they should be able to run it you know, four or five miles down the pipeline, which is about as far as you can go with the electronics uh, signal, and and then use that data instead of satellite data to um with the artificial intelligence and so well what what they're doing here is they're they're kind of doing a lateral move with a lot of the research they've done at north dakota state university on agriculture Uh and similar thing where they started out in the satellites and then they went down to the drones um and then they went down to smaller drones and smaller ones which Probably are the size of a you know a good sized coffee table in terms of the body. So by uh-huh. by drones, these aren't the ones you buy at Walmart. These are you know about four feet, four, four foot base, and then they have some wings. And honestly, they're like made out of out of foam though. I mean, they're not you know they're not like uh, uh, made out of metal. They're they're made out of fiberglass and they're made out of foam. And because they just need them up there to basically survey the crops. And so if you right. just take out a row of sunflowers or potatoes and put in pipelines, essentially you're making that lateral move with technology with a lot of the sensors and optics that have already been built through North Dakota State's what we call the brain. Because um, UND, uh, University of North Dakota, does so much with the uh, Air Force that they're kind of the, 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 the brawn, if you will. They're kind of the, 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 the machine. They're, that's wow. where the final product is in terms of the the drones are up in Grand Forks. So it's it's interesting to see how they're taking that over because I've been on uh, this program many times with uh, North Dakota Ag Commissioner Doug Goring, and we talk about the day where they have real-time sensors now in the ground about the size of a quarter that relay information to those drones and satellite in, in real time so that if the potato gets, say, a bl- some blight on it, it uh-huh. then it then in real time 
can relay it over to say instead of a UAS, you got a you got a little four wheeler that's artificially intelligence. That's a UA. It's a drone basically, but a four wheeler, and then it'll drive down the path, and then it'll just perfume mist, pesticide or herbicide on that potato blight. So that way, saving the farmer a small fortune, in in chemicals. And then, oh, yeah, yeah that, that's that's pretty much what's going on for the last 15 years in North Dakota with with the uh, drones program when it comes to agriculture. That's what they've been trying to do. And they and I want to say three years ago, uh, Doug Goring and I were sitting in the sitting in the lounge doing an interview after a conference, you know, after hours doing doing one of those lounge interviews. And that's what we were talking about real time information three years ago. So fast forward today. Now we're putting it into pipes to where we're going to have real time. And it sounds like we're really close if they're going out publicly in other states and talking about it, that we're real yeah. close to having real time spill monitoring and gas leak monitoring then. So I'm sorry, I, I, I just know a little bit about it. So I want to add a little context for the listeners out there and then for yourself to see, is that kind of what the idea was, is that we're going to get to that real time uh, monitoring? Exactly, real time because they they said you know you you aren't going to have to wait a week or two to find it by. And, and actually, I asked them. It's been a couple of years ago when the North Dakota study came out, and I asked them, you know, what's wrong with the alarms? Do we have a bunch of incompetent engineers? And they said, well, designing Jason a alarm for a pipeline system, you know, natural gas, liquids, or crude oil, is really difficult. And part of it is because, like I said, if you have a quarter size hole and you're just losing. A portion of the liquid. I mean, if the entire pipe breaks off in half, you know, it's pretty easy to figure out you got problems because the pressure goes way down in the volume. But if you have a small leak, and apparently most of the leaks are either cracks or they're, you know, they're either cracks or the uh, welds fail, but they don't totally fail. They just, you know, you just get a good gusher for, you know, days or weeks or months on end. Um, it's difficult for that sensor to pick up a decline in volume or decline in um, or decline in pressure, and they they said it was interesting. And of course, uh, some of the operators they said you know, a lot of those. If you put the alarms to be very very sensitive, um, you'll get all these false alarms. And when you get false alarms, the operators they stop. You know, you ignore it because like God, I went out and I checked twenty five times, and you know the alarms way too sensitive. So we, you know, we turn it back, which is you know again, then you have a real real problem, and you know. You don't get the uh, you don't get the reading. So anyway, that's sort of where they're going. And Ohio also made a presentation. The Ohio regulators, the oil and gas. And I tell you, between Ohio and North Dakota, I mean, those are the two probably cutting edge states, believe it or not. And uh, Ohio, you love this. They got a drone. Actually, the drone is a sixty thousand dollar drone. And then they on on it they they have attached a forty thousand dollar magnometer and what they're doing is flying over these old farm fields to find um these old abandoned wells and of course in north dakota you don't have quite the issue because ohio they started drilling there in the 1860s you know the record there's no records or you know you drilled a hole you didn't plug it you just left the casing in and so um the ohio regulators are are using magnometers to find you know environmental you know where you you could smell the gas or you could smell the oil or the water is being contaminated and like you can't figure out where it's coming from. Well, they can, they can find the stuff using these. Uh, and of course I ask, you know, Jesus, the state of Ohio, because every once in a while you crash these things or you get, you know, you get caught in a, a, a breeze or, you know, they have mechanical failures. I said, God, you know, you, it's like crashing, you know, a Ferrari almost if you have a hundred thousand dollar vehicle <laughs> Or a drone vehicle, and you crash it in the farmer's field. Uh, and I ask them, "Are you insured?" And they said, "Well, no, we're not insured. We're, the state of Ohio is self-insured." So, and they said, "Thank God we haven't had a we haven't had a wreck yet." But it, you know, all the all the uh, drone pilots in both North Dakota and Ohio, you know, have licenses. They're all certified. Um, and actually, North Dakota, as you noted, you know, is probably well ahead of most other states, including Oklahoma, including Texas, including Louisiana, uh, on the drone on the drone issues. So that's sort of exciting. The other interesting thing with regard to this eye pipe is uh, the other this, the this, the other technology besides drones and satellite data 
is they have these little sensors. They look like golf balls. I mean, literally, they look like a golf ball. And they, you throw it in one end of the pipe, and you pump it on down. And apparently, as it goes down, it will, it will and I, it, they didn't explain it real well, because some of this is proprietary with the company involved. But it will, if there's small leaks, um, they'll be able to figure out, Jason, you know, where the leak is. And the size of it, and part of it's the frequency of the noise, and the um, I, I, again, they were pretty cryptic because it's the technology. It's a project that is partly state sponsored, but on the other hand, these companies are reserving the patents and the technology if they figure something out that works real well. And so they put these golf balls in at one end. You know, they pump it down for 20, ten or twenty miles. They take them out. And, um, you know, read the data. And I don't know whether they, you know, you get real-time data with those or actually when you pump them out, you know, you have to download them. I, they're, they're, but they look just, you know, just about the size of, you know, less than a baseball and a little bigger than a golf ball. And they shoot those down your, your pipe. And uh, apparently they've been proven to be real effective too. So that's the, um, those are the three types of, uh, technologies they're using uh, with regard to the uh, pipeline integrity and it's a huge issue um, the pipeline integrity just because we got a bunch of older pipes as you know I mean North Dakota well actually the US year after year I mean we keep producing more and more oil more and more natural gas liquids the lines get longer they you know you've got more and more people building stuff along the pipeline route so you have more and more issues with regard to um, you know, strikes and disruptions. So, uh, in any event, it's a it, it's a pretty cool. It was a pretty cool project you'll hear about, and they talked about it for about an hour with a bunch of slides. So it was it was worth the time. Well, and what's going to happen from that? And I think this is part of the reason why they're being cryptic too. Your uh, rationales and reasons were also there, but a lot of it is is this is a technology that is really set up to become big data big data. And so just the exponentialness of it over the next year is going to be astronomical for the industry. The, the, the information that they're going to be able to extrapolate and layer together, uh, it's in such a, a quick fashion, is going to be enormous. And that's part of it too, because they don't know what the end result is yet. They, they know that how theory works and quantum physics and exponentiality when it comes to technology so they know there's going to be a very good end product uh, as you know lo looking through that's why Hess is involved and good night midstream and I'm taking a look at a few of the Oasis and Whiting yep. One Oak yep. you know I mean these are yep. these are big companies that are involved with this and so um, it's it's good to good to hear that they're going to these other conferences and talking about some of this technology what else came out of there? You mentioned um, there was some uh, this I pipe and some North Dakota speakers, but how about down in the Permian? Is there any electric fracking talk that came out of this conference? And as far as uh, buzz, or was there was there anything else out of the Permian that you noticed? No, they really didn't talk about electronic fracking. I, it was interesting though. You, we went around the, the they they go around the table, and like all the regulators talk about how active things are and what the main problems are. And I was pretty shocked, Jason. The, uh, the, there's a lot of areas, a lot of states that are not real active right now. And most of those, you know, have, you know, a lot of the natural gas plays, obviously. And so North Dakota is doing okay. You're not, it's things aren't, things aren't rocking like they were, you know, a few years ago, but they're still doing okay. Texas Permian Basin is doing you know, pretty good. That's the hot spot to be. But you go back and you talk to some of the, you know, the Pennsylvania regulators, the Ohio regulators, the West Virginia, and part of the problem there is a lot of the prospects are natural gas, and part of the other problem is you got too much natural gas, and so the price is really low, and then you have issues, you know, with the pipelines. They're trying to get it to market, and everything's getting gummed up because the, of the opposition that, you know, you finally, you can... You get those pipelines built, but it takes, you know, a, a series of lawyers and courts and judicial, judicial decisions. But they, um, so I was surprised that, uh, you know, when we have 
in that 2018, we had record crude oil, we had record natural gas, we had record natural gas liquid production. But you know, a lot of states, well, for example, Michigan, the guy, the Michigan regulator, you know, said, uh, you know, we had, believe it or not, we have a hundred year low in, in drilling permits um, last year in 2018. And part of it's because, well, there isn't, you know, Michigan has a few reefs up there and they have a, a basin, but they said, you know, part of it's just the, the natural gas and, uh, you know, no one has a, a, a big interest. Um, Oklahoma seemed to be doing okay. And one, one of the things, and this is probably the most significant thing that I've pulled out, and it's, it's this is not a North Dakota problem, and um, it's induced seismic. And you know, apparently the induced seismic issues that we saw in Oklahoma are sort of slowly increasing over in the Permian and in, in, in both New Mexico, in the Delaware Basin, as well as in the Midland Basin in Texas. So, um, and the Oklahoma regulators told me but a couple of people, I was talking to them afterwards, and they said, God, it must not have heard that right. And you actually went and checked it. What the regulators said is you know, the, the number of events in Oklahoma has dropped from like, um, oh, geez, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but like, like four or five per day down to like less than one per day, which is a, a magnitude of 2.7. So because they're they've reduced the amount of water that can be injected in the pressures and disposed of. But what they said now is the remaining, the remaining uh, induced seismic events are being triggered by the actually by the fracking. And this is not good news because, because what it means is you can control your, your wastewater and you know, how many wells you drill and where you put them and make people. But if you're generating uh, induced seismic from your fracking operations, and this is Oklahoma only. This is you know the Oklahoma regulators, and I went and I talked to them. I said, "Gee, do you have a study on that? Can you have any writing?" And they said, "Well, no. We can show you though, and we know there's a correlation between fracking, which gives um, you know the anti-frackers. That's you know we don't want any fracking at all. You know, gives them a, a chair, I guess, to stand on. But again, the good news is at least you know, if the induced seismic issues." I don't know whether it's the geology or the rock up there, but in North Dakota, you don't you don't have those issues. It's a much smaller issue in the Permian Basin and in Texas, but it is it is an issue and it's increasing. It's been a you know, pretty big issue in Oklahoma, although they've really done a good job regulatory wise, you know, getting those numbers down, um, getting those numbers down to you know something that's uh, that's really reasonable and and. Um, in any event, uh, yeah, the numbers, I guess, the, the Oklahoma numbers, I just pulled them up here. 2014, there was 5.4 seismic events per day in Oklahoma. Today, or, or this year, it's 0.75. So they've really, you've cut, you know, God, you've cut 80% of the seismic events out, but the ones that are left are due to the fracking. And, of course, you look at the amount of water and sand you stick in a well, you can sort of understand why you might have some minor uh frack issues induced seismic issues because it's a you, you go i go up and down i-35 here from between dallas and oklahoma city and man there's either you know, like every other truck seems to be either have drilling pipe on it or it has casing on it or it has or it's a sand truck full of fracking sand and hell they all drive 85 miles an hour probably just like up in the Balkan. <laughs> And so you get behind a truck and you know you're going to get a ticket because they're just they're just wheeling down the highway so hmm. you know i was making a few notes while you were talking and i just started thinking about you know the natural gas that's going on here and i i can remember lee tillman from marathon oil telling me it's really difficult economically to ship a molecule all the way to south america you know, and, and I understood what he was saying there, that price of natural gas is not warrant the marketplace to invest in it yet. And I get that, okay, but at the same time, man, there's such an abundance of it. And you've seen the flaring, and nobody wants to talk about the flaring. And to me, this is an issue that needs to be addressed immediately because we can do something about it. That's that's the reason. It's not because it's it's... It's, it's a blight and it's an eyesore and it's not because of this and that. Because, listen, if we're going to start picking and choosing, 
then I've got a laundry list much, much higher in priority than this stuff. The only reason I'm bringing it up is because we do put a lot of money towards wind energy, and we have. We've put a lot of money towards solar energy, and we have for the last 10 years at least. And over the course of 10 years, their, their results have not been impressive. And I don't think that is a political statement. I think that, that they would tell you that as an industry, that they failed. They, they were going to have a terawatt of, of uh, storage capacity for the solar industry by now, and they don't have that available to the marketplace. Wind energy has gone so far backwards, they don't even have a reclamation program in place yet for these giant wind turbines that are going to end up just being an eyesore that don't that do not work on some farmer's land in 20 years. So right. to suggest whether we should take a look at diverting some of those subsidies to the natural gas world is not out of line in my mind. That is not a political thing. That that is a worthy question to be pontificated by leaders. And I'm not hearing that conversation. Is I don't know if it's because of the anti-drilling movement that's going on, the fact that Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren are talking about banning oil and gas drilling in their actual platform so that the narrative has gotten that extreme. But I want to know, I'd like to know your opinion on what I'm talking about here to where should we at least be having a conversation about maybe subsidizing the natural gas industry? Because the science projects are there. And the oil and gas companies, they've got, they, they, you know, they, they've got accountants and shareholders that are going to dictate that, they're, that they can only invest in certain ways. So instead of taking more money from them in fees and taxes and regulations, what about if they got some natural gas money to spend? Then all of a sudden, these small companies that have these science projects, they get a nice little influx of money. And then, boom, you've got a whole new economy working like never before. Talk to me a little bit about the natural gas futures and what I just basically, um, I don't know. I, I, that was a little bit of a war and peace question there. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like the theory. It's uh, What is interesting, I was going to bring up that, yeah, the natural gas flaring has the regulators have done a pretty good job, especially in North Dakota, to build them. I mean, it takes a little bit of time to build that stuff out. You just can't go slap pipeline in the ground. But it, the the flaring has decreased substantially, from what I understand. And it really didn't come up at the conference at all, although I know it's still an issue uh, in the Permian Basin. And I know they're building out the pipelines. And actually, the capacity has really taken a big jump upward uh, for natural gas as well as crude oil or will in the next uh, two or three months. So um, I will tell you, I've talked to some natural gas liquids experts and they were actually one of them came and talked to my class at OU and he essentially said, you know, the natural gas liquids are something that most people consider a nuisance. So most people don't really look for it, but if you, if you, if you actually go and you put these projects together, they can be very, very profitable because, you know, nobody appreciates the value. And there's four or five companies that are active and for natural gas liquids. Of course, that's not natural gas, but it's uh, the heavy stuff that comes out, the relatively heavy stuff that comes out of natural gas. They said, you know, you can make a lot of money and then, you know, you, know, you clean up the gas and can, you know, send it down, send it down the road. But from an economic standpoint, and actually just from a, you know, long-term standpoint, we have so much natural gas in the United States, it, it'll, you know, it'll be 50 to 100 years before we have any issues, if then, um, with regard to, and so between now and then, what, you know, what, what is happening, well, you'll love this, Jason, um, what is happening, you know, not only in the United States, but in Canada, the week before we had this regulator, regulators meeting, and there were a number of regulators there from, uh, from Canada, Apparently, some company up in uh, Alberta, essentially, they just shut the doors. They said, you know, Alberta, you guys have screwed up. The politicians and regulators had screwed up the market so bad. You know, the price of natural gas was zero. Um, they, they essentially took 4,700 wells, gave the pipeline, the keys, laid off all their employees and said, you know, Alberta, now you're in charge of this. And, you know, it's there's actually $320 million worth of plugging liability. You know, if you can't if you can't figure out, well, if you can't regulate reasonably, and of course, 
you know, the regulators take on this, well, it's a function of the natural gas market. You know, gas is so cheap, they should have been drilling for oil. On the other hand, as you and I know, you know, the, some of the pipeline issues up there, the reason the prices for Canadian oil and Canadian natural gas are so much cheaper is they, you know, they're landlocked and part, part of it's, you know, their, their political system isn't allowing the pipelines to be built to, you know, access their natural resources, which is an incredibly, um, well, it's, it's very damaging. Obviously, this company was essentially bankrupt, and they just said, hey, you know, here's the keys. Apparently, all the executives resigned, the board resigned, you know, the shareholders realized you know, they, they took a total hit. Companies were zero. Actually, as company has a negative net worth. And, uh, and apparently, this happened in Pennsylvania also within the last six months where some company apparently handed over a, about a thousand wells apparently to the to the state and said hey we don't have the money to plug these you know they're not economic and uh and, and that's that is a problem that some of the regulators are bringing up that you know the the some of these marginal wells as they get depleted you know the unconventional as well as conventional are being are not being plugged correctly they're not being remediated or they're being sold to you know, Joe's oil company and I run it out of my garage and I have no assets. So I really can't, you know, I really can't plug the wells when they need to be plugged. And, um, now where all this goes, you know, Lord knows it's part of its economics, part of its regulations. And it, it gets to the point. And again, this is, there is a balance. If you start regulating and regulate too aggressively and you make everybody, if you make the project, the property worth zero, you know, They'll, you know, you'll file bankruptcy or you'll walk away, and and the state, the state or the province will be end, end up, you know, remediating properties that um, that uh, you know, might have been viable uh, with with prices a little more robust, especially natural gas prices. But but I like your theory about natural gas um, being at least know, maybe not subsidized, but at least being encouraged uh, versus versus wind and versus solar. I mean, no, I'm, gonna... I'm actually thinking about a subsidy now that the, the more I was just listening to you, oh. I, I'm not a fan of subsidies, you know. I mean, you know, I don't get into my politicalness too much, but I'm not a big fan of subsidies because I, I believe in the essence of capitalism. But when you hold an industry so far accountable and then on top of that tax them and then on top of that give them more fees... I mean, it's, you know, they, they've, they've paid their fair share. They've given more than their pound of flesh. I, I mean, the oil and gas industry doesn't need you and me sticking up for them. They don't. But, uh -huh. yep, but, yep. At, but at the same time, we're both fair people. And we look at life and say, you know, this is a little bit out of balance here. And when I take a look at the natural gas industry, this is a solvable problem. This is a solvable problem that could create some brand new just state-of-the-art ideas and innovation like the last time i think you and i spoke we talked about some crazy nut up in canada um you, uh, using natural gas to, to to mine bitcoins and oh that's right and yep. that that is one of the craziest most insane ideas i've ever heard in my life but you know what at least he did it and, and it was productive and I don't understand how that all works, but apparently there's a bunch of people that are willing to pay money to understand it, so good for them. And, you know, just hope that the Bitcoin world doesn't crash and all that stuff. Because <laughs> One of my favorite memes I ever saw was uh, when Facebook and Instagram went down for a day and there was like, I don't know, some, some little newspaper carrier or something like that, you know, and it said, uh, Kim Kardashian's uh, distribution during the Facebook whatever zero or instagram zero and then the newspaper at least he still had 200 clients or something like that it was just it was just <laughs> absolutely hilarious that shows you that you know if if one of those companies like facebook or instagram or whatever the heck the government can come and d destroy them they can go belly up by shareholders there's a number of ways that they can go away and then all of a sudden those people their distribution's just gone completely you know overnight so right. um Anyway, I don't know how we got off on that little little sidebar there, but the whole idea behind the natural gas, um, and I, I again, I hate to use the word subsidy, but at the same time, if, if we're going to kick some money towards, you know, 
you you know this, Joe Dancy, as well as I do. A lot of these guys that are working on these science projects, um, they're you know five man operations. A lot of them are just two man operations that are living on the well site, um, right. and and these oil companies, they're running out of research and development money. They are because they're trying to invest in solar. They're trying to invest in wind. They're trying to invest in geothermal. They're trying to invest in natural gas. I mean, they, they have to invest in all these other ways so that they don't get taxed to the high noon, you know? And so I think it is actually irresponsible. God, listen to me spinning these words here. <laughs> I, I think it's irresponsible for our leaders right now not to have a conversation about should we, for the next three years, invest in natural gas and get that flaring down to 50%. Imagine that, going from 90 down to 50 in three years. The Just the absolute spurn in the economy, just, just the jump start that would happen from that alone would be absolutely incredible. And it would come in new ways that would be non-traditional. It would be non-traditional. It would totally open up new sectors of the marketplace. Okay, now I got to take a step back because I'm, I'm I, I just get really passionate about this. <laughs> well, actually, the uh, the good news is, I mean, I don't, you know, I think a lot of the flaring issues have been addressed or are being addressed by the regulators. Other than I've read about the Permian Basin still has issues. And part of the reason, Jason, the Permian Basin has issues is because it's a you know, it's the Wild West out there. Everybody's drilling as fast as they can, and you um, you don't have the take takeaway capacity. At least you didn't, and now it's... Yeah, it's but keep in up. mind, those are pretty inflated, too. Like, in North Dakota, I think it's like 80%, 85%, 90%. I mean, it's... it's That's right. It's, it's fine within what the parameters are, but when you've got the... You know, when, when basically you've got the Republican Party who's in pretty good with business and very open with the with the regulators, you know, it's it's a three man crew that sets this together. The governor, the ag commissioner and the attorney general. OK, right. They set they set the numbers. And if you go ahead and take a look at, you know, who's on their industry panels, it's all people that work within the industry. There's no farmers on there. There's no cafe owners. You know, I mean, so. It's that, that's why North Dakota is very good at regulation is because most of these task force and, and these committees are made up of people within industry. So it, they're, they're very much. But keep in mind, though, they, they have that old school capitalistic mindset that the businesses are going to take care of their communities. And for the most part, they do, especially out in the oil and gas communities. In fact, the oil companies take much better care of the communities than the government does. Holy smokes, is that apparent? I mean, you got oil companies building roads out there. I'm serious. Right. Oh, no, right. I'm serious. The oil companies have literally built half of Western North Dakota through their investments. And I, I don't feel bad saying that at all. And I might get some regulators mad at me and some politicians mad at me for saying that. But when you take a look at not even five years ago, a lot of those roads in Western North Dakota would fly off of their... their um, footing because of a rainstorm i mean they, they were built to only have a combine go on it five times a year not huh. not 50 trucks in a day right. you know what i mean so right. it's, it's not all their fault but what i'm saying is that we need to get to the present and the present says is that down in the permian and in the bakken we've got natural gas in abundance and we don't need to look at it as a problem we need to look at it just like we looked at the sun and just like we looked at the wind, meaning it's there. It's there every day, whether we like it or not. So why don't we invest some money in securing it? We got a crazy guy trying to Bitcoin mine or whatever. We got another guy trying to turn it into natural gas. We got another guy who's trying to uh, reverse it around and generate the well sites on site. You know, I mean, there's, there's 10, 15 different ways that we can name that these crazy scientists and these clever capitalists are trying to capitalize on this problem known as natural gas. So rather than calling it a problem, I think we got to start looking at the solutions. And that's why I guess I'm kind of calling these. Am, am I going to get into politics next? Because I don't like politics. What's going on here? <laughs> uh, good question. Good question. The, um, it is interesting. Actually, at the, um, the regulators meeting, we, they did talk about um, companies, how much they've done to help uh, some of these 
some of these smaller communities out in the oil. For example, we had a representative from Watford City, North Dakota, and from Big Lake, Texas. They call it Big Lake, Texas, Jason. But I went through Big Lake about a year and a half ago to see the Big Lake, and there's no Big Lake. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of like what they call the big guy tiny? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it looked like, you know, it, it, actually, I, it was pretty interesting to see. But it, uh, but they were talking in you know, these small towns where you have the influx of, I mean, it's just as a, from a governmental standpoint, it is very, very difficult for the, the town people to, you know, for the schools, for the roads, for the water, for the everything. It's, it creates, you know, a tremendous, and they said how much the, the companies assisted in many cases, but still, it, it it's still, you go out and you, you know, you want to get some workers to lay some concrete and you, they're all in the oil field. So you really, you know, you don't have the stores, you don't have the, you don't have the hotels that you really need, and and the, to the extent the companies can help, and the, they have helped, um, that's great. But it's still it's still an issue. But that's hell. That's been going on for a hundred years. It's well, actually two hundred years in the U.S. You know, it's boom gold rush, you know, and then it's the the you know the blight. So uh, same thing with oil. Same thing with silver. So anyway, and it's, farming. It's interesting. And farming. And I mean, farming. T- yeah, you know, exactly. it doesn't have to go too far back. Look at the wheat prices dropped in the 70s, and all of a sudden, you know, farmers are going yeah. bankrupt. And I can I, I imagine it probably happened somewhere, and, uh, you know, since then. That's just the big one I remember reading about. And, and you know, I was a kid at that time, so I, you know, heard a lot about that that, that period of time. And, you know, kids, kids forget. Kids meaning people of all ages. You know, back in the 1980s, Buying a house was at like 15%. It was it was like buying a house on a credit card. People don't understand that. That that that's not that far away that we were still trying to figure out how to make this credit and you know debt and chemistry that whole set work and God, could you even imagine buying a house on a credit card today? Holy <laughs> smokes. Uh, but yeah, I mean what? You know, yeah, it was twenty was percent down too. I think I can't remember ten or twenty percent. Yeah, but um, but then again, yeah, you know, I mean, a hundred thousand house, a hundred thousand dollar house back then was probably twenty thousand or five, you know, ten thousand. So I mean, the yeah. the, the yeah. numbers have changed pretty significantly. But uh, okay, well, uh, we should probably I'm looking at the clock here, taking a look at at the time, and so the Permian. Was there anybody from Colorado or anybody that you spoke to? that has anything to say about what's going on in Colorado. Of course, Colorado passed that new legislation uh, that v- makes it very difficult to drill within a certain amount of feet within a public structure or a structure. I call it the kind of the smoking ban uh, template to where you use public safety, public health, and you do it within a certain amount of feet from a building and then then you've got your you know essentially it's it's a it's a ban at the end of the day it becomes a ban and so uh i, I can't remember the percentage amount but a good a good number of percentages over 50 percent of the shale plays would have been impacted in colorado with this new ban i talked to destiny mcmillan uh last week she's a third generation oil family senior land man and she said that she knows of three companies that have already left the state and moved to uh, uh, oklahoma Right. And Texas, and then she also mentioned we talked about Wyoming, the federal judge uh, putting a ban or, oh, yeah. or saying no to some federal leases for the first time in the state's history, as far as I know. So, does anybody talking about this Colorado in terms of you know, like, are they worried? Are they not concerned? Nobody talking about it. Just uh, talk to me about what you're hearing from your industry folk. God, that's a great question. I didn't even. Uh... It, it, uh, the Colorado regulators and the New Mexico regulators said, you know, there's sort of been a game change with the last election and the game change from being a little more, you know, pro industry or at least reasonable to, you know, you're, you're leaving in the ground Bernie Sanders attitude. They didn't put it quite like that, but they just said, you know, to date though, I mean, the regulators sort of, as a regulator, you marched the tune of either the governor or or to the legislature. And they said, you know, from a regulatory standpoint, there hasn't been a whole bunch of changes yet. But you know, going forward, because of the 
you know, change in attitude towards the oil industry, attitude being either neutral or, or partly positive or at least reasonable to one that's, you know, anti-oil, anti-hydrocarbons, anti-development. Um, they expect, they expect um, to see changes going forward. And I think we've talked about this before, too, when you... When you start making things more expensive, when you put on more restrictions, that just makes everything less valuable. So your your oil production is less valuable, your leases are less valuable, your minerals are less valuable. There's less jobs, there's less tax revenue. Um, you do need you know regulation, you need, do need controls, but you know when it goes to the point like you just mentioned, and I can't remember exactly the numbers but you know when you're banning 65 percent of the wells because of setback requirements you know that's substantial and it'll have a substantial impact on the on the economy um and i you know in those states where the setback is is required and actually i was going to do some research that's my summer or fall research you know looking at the legal the legal cases dealing with you know, how far can you go from a regulatory standpoint before you're taking someone's property and you have to compensate them. And, you know, Denton, Texas up here, That's interesting. Oh, three or four years ago, uh, three or four years ago, Denton actually had an ordinance that actually banned and it got passed by all the citizens to ban fracking. And that was real clear. They wanted to ban it completely without, you know, uh, and that would have been a pretty clear, you know, you're taking, because the Barnett Shale's up there and people mm-hmm. are getting, I mean, they were getting five thousand dollars an acre, and you're essentially making their their minerals worthless. And um, you, you, as it turns out, the Texas legislature in Austin um, sort of fixed that by giving them the railroad commission jurisdiction. But in in Colorado and in New Mexico, um, with yeah, you know, with their current trend, I mean, I I'm sure there's going to be proposals out there that your question is, can they go that far, you know, without compensating? And and it's a tough call. But I and I need I've I've got I've pulled down about twenty cases and I got them sort of outlined. I just need to I need to put all of my thinking together because it's going to be a hot issue. And I you know I'd like no, to that's be a one great, of the experts. That's a great angle. That is an outstanding yep. angle because it's almost like a reverse eminent domain. It's like you're yep. it, you know instead of coming in to say we're going to do this for the betterment of society, you're reversing it and saying, you know, we're going to devalue your land for the, right. for the, for the worst mint of you. <laughs> so I always had a good friend of mine from Georgia. He always said the government's only, the only thing the government has the real power to do is make you homeless. That's what he'd always <laughs> say to me. And I'd laugh. And as I get older, I, I understand more what he's talking about there. I really, really do. And I just chuckle at that. You know, the other part, Getting back to the natural gas, what you just mentioned is is a great part of the is another good argument for the natural gas subsidy because what a lot of people don't understand and oil companies are going to get mad at me for saying this, but the lease owners, the mineral owners, as far as I know, do not get paid on the the, the flared gas. So not only do the do the um, oil companies not get to capitalize on that resource. But the mineral owners don't even get to capitalize on that wasted resource. Do you see what I mean? To where it, it was challenged in North Dakota. And I do believe that the oil companies, they it was favored in their side that they did not have to pay the mineral owners because it didn't go to market or something like that. But it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's one of those things that you just don't really want to talk about. But at the same time, I'm talking about it because if we did subsidize the natural gas world, now all of a sudden the mineral owners would get more money too. So the local businesses would get more. Do you see what I mean to where this is not a right. dumb idea? This is a really good idea. Right. Well, and, I, and actually the, um, yeah, the royally, and I, boy, it's been a while since I looked at the numbers here in Texas, but um, you know, some of these areas, if you, the mineral owners, I mean, they're not getting rich on this stuff, but they're getting, you know, between four thousand and maybe ten thousand uh, a year in royalties when they have a, a producing well, which is you know, pretty substantial. And then you get the bonuses too, and it's a uh, you know it has a huge it has a huge incremental wealth effect um, you know on the citizens on the state. You pay taxes on that stuff, um, and they, like you say, 
if you're flaring it and you're not using it, then you know you're you know nobody's getting value. But if somehow you can, we can figure out how to how to get the stuff uh, to market or utilized. Uh, at least we'll get some economic value. So. Well, I'm just looking at like Doug Burgum, the governor of North Dakota. He always talks about his dream is to re, you know, repurpose that natural gas to grow blueberries, just right. like they do in Iceland. And in the the Permian, the gentleman I've talked to down there, the several people I've talked to, they're talking about these neat neat um, science projects they're doing. They're doing to actually turn natural gas into ir- irrigationable water, irrigable water, to turn that desert into some farmland. I mean, right. that's the type of stuff that I believe the people of the United States would get behind over, you know, some big giant wind turbines or another right. another failed solar project. Once they re- I was it you and I talking about the McMansions or um, these these um, McMansions that went ahead and and put these solar panels on over the last three to four years as part of this big movement to try to get, you know, the the rich and the wealthy and the affluent to be the leaders in the solar movement. Well, they're finding out now that they lost money on that deal. I mean, they didn't even, you know, it's it's now just hubcaps on a car. It just looks good. Yeah, yeah, it's a, a statement, uh, a virtue statement or whatever they call it. It's, yeah, the numbers don't, yeah, the payouts are, at least the numbers I've seen, the payouts are usually seven to ten years, um, which, is, which is pretty pretty bad because the average uh from what i've been told at least in oklahoma texas your average house if you throw a suit a few solar panels on there to make it a reasonable generation load you're talking 25 or thirty thousand, um and you could buy a heck of a lot of electricity for 25 or thirty thousand. well and and, <laughs> and these well, here's what the regu this is what irritates me about the regulators and again i'm not trying to be political here but this is this is an observation and this is just a fact because it irritates me they haven't figured out how technology works and how the world of moore's theory and moore's law and the exponentiality of technology works that if you expect something that operates on today's technology to pay someone back in five to seven years, you're already starting at a loss. It has to pay you back in two to three years, otherwise it ain't worth it because you have to upgrade your technology every two to three years. And when you upgrade your technology every two to three years, it costs you another small fortune. Just take a look at iPhones, take a look at, I mean, people who had iPhone sixes can barely even operate anymore because they don't even have earbud jacks and they don't have the right plugins and they, you know what I mean? And the software isn't compatible anymore. And that's just at a local consumer small level. Imagine when you start talking about, oh, geez, we don't have the technology five years later to operate these solar panels anymore. And we just spent 50 grand on them. That's what I mean. The regulators have to figure this stuff out before they start putting subsidies towards things that don't make any sense at this point. So, boy, you must have done something to me today because I, I, I just I just got to burn my saddle. That's good. Well, you know, I think it's time, you know. It's time that these conversations start need, need to be had. And it's the same conversations for the same amount of time. And like I said, if if the solar and wind talk, which honestly – the oil and gas industry has been behind the solar and wind talk, and they've been yep. investing in solar and wind energy. And you know what? It hasn't gone well. It hasn't gone well. And, and there's enough evidence to say that to where maybe we need to start taking a look at some other areas. And, and I do believe natural gas is at the top of the priority list, not because it's the most urgent. It's because it's the most abundant. It's the most realistic. And it's the most... Um, What's the word? It's it's the most goal oriented that we can accomplish. I oh man, we could if if we put in some new pipelines and, and invested in some new uh, technology and subsidize a few of these small companies. Oh, it's no telling what we could do as a country. I mean, who knows? Some sort of new super plastic could come out of it. And guess what? All of a sudden now, composite decks are less than a thousand dollars. All of a sudden now, the average house of 600 square feet can go to Menards, go to Lowe's, go to Home Depot and pick up a 
to do a rector set deck that you can build on a weekend at your house for under fifteen hundred dollars because we decided to invest in some natural gas company that's that's the type of stuff i'm talking about that can happen very easily the same investments we put in towards the military we should really consider putting in towards gas oil and gas right I, I agree. So I guess I am running for office somewhere because I, I, there, there, there's a, there's going to be a few oil companies out there saying, I kind of like this guy's mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you got to think outside the box every now and then, and sometimes you just got to kick that box around a little bit too. So anyway, uh, let's wrap up here. Just kind of final thoughts, just um, what, what, what you think coming from that conference and the colleagues you've been talking to, where you think the industry is heading? Well, I tell, actually, the um, I was a couple people talked to me earlier this week. Jason just done, uh, yeah, pricing going forward for the rest of the year, and it seems to be the consensus is with demand growing. Unless we have a huge knockdown trade war with China, that demand supply is going to see oil prices get a little more robust going into the fall. Um, some folks like Raymond James are looking, you know, for prices. You know, Pretty substantially higher than sixty dollars West Texas Intermediate, but I, you know, going forward, I can see seventy dollars West Texas Intermediate by by Christmas, just based on supply and demand. And I, 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 I think the uh, I don't think we're going to see a big dip in oil prices again, unless there's a huge global trade war. I, I think I don't think we'll see it. I think people will, will have some rational basis for keeping china and, and u.s and global trade going forward but uh in any event that was sort of that's my viewpoint that's sort of the viewpoint of you know, the regulators sort of track everything because obviously part of their part of their job is you know permitting and production and and if things are ramping up you know they're they'll be ramping up people and when they're ramping down they're laying off people actually pennsylvania laid off like 39 people in the last six months which i thought was interesting regulators um because things are so slow there they don't have the money and um but going forward you know everybody's like cautiously optimistic and i i would agree with that 